Our second speaker will be Alex Paredes. He's an associate professor at the Department of Biology at the University of Washington, and he'll be giving a talk titled Cytoskeletal Innovations for Sticking Around. Thanks, Julie. Okay, so uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today and uh, get to talk to you about some of my work on Giardia, which I think is a really fascinating uh, organism, and, and it's really understudied. So first I wanna make the point that it's a, it's a major organism, I mean, it's a major parasite. It's zoonotic, and so it can infect any mammal, but uh, about 200 million people a year get infected by Giardia, and basically it's a fecal-oral infection route, so there's cysts in the environment, and when people swallow these cysts, they pass through the stomach, and the stomach acid is a signal for them to excess, so they crawl out of the cyst wall, and then they rapidly colonize intestine. And one thing that's strange you can notice right away is these uh, parasites have two diploid nuclei, um, and unlike like bacteria that we saw earlier that infect cells, these are extracellular parasites, so they never invade any tissues. They literally latch on to the intestine, as I'm showing you here. So this is a bunch of Giardia parasites in a gerbil intestine. And most of how they attach is attributed to uh, this structure here called the ventral disc. Um, and this is a microtubule-based organelle, so I'm showing you some um, expansion microscopy into the Josh Vaughn's group at, in chemistry. So, so um, the, the color coding here is to give you the impression that that this is a dome-shaped structure, and these microtubules are 40 nanometers apart, so it's pretty cool. Um, but, but most attention's been uh, given to this structure as mediating attachment, but I'm gonna tell you today there's another structure in Giardia, um, which Julie's talk kind of set up a little bit for me, um, called the, the ventral flange, and so we'll get into that. Um, but the other thing is Giardia is a, a really, really divergent eukaryote, and so it has the most divergent actin of any eukaryote that you can manipulate in the lab, so the actin is only, um, 58% uh, identical on average to other actins, and none of the common probes work. So we can't use like phylloid and latrunculin, cytoclase, and none of those things work. Um, and we've highlighted all the non-conservative substitutions in uh, front and back views of, of the actin monomer, and these red substitutions are at filament contact points. Um, so we know just a single mutation in yeast actin, for example, would have profound impact on the uh, filament dynamics. And so normally we think of uh, Actin sequence is being really constrained because there's this whole host of proteins that, that Julie mentioned some of that have to interact with this protein, and so you can't, you can't let the sequence diverge, um, and so these are proteins like this, and, and it turns out that Giardia is missing all the conserved actin mining proteins, okay? E even myosin, the motor, the contractile motors that we heard about that, that are famously involved in cell division. So when I tell people this, they always ask, okay, well then how does Giardia divide if it doesn't have you know, myosin two or any other myosins? Um, and so, we, we did some work on that, which I don't have time to, to show you all of, but it's gonna set up the, the next part of my talk, and so I just wanna show you our model. And the idea is that you have uh, these cells, they go through mitosis, and they have to build two new ventral discs, they take apart the old disc, and unlike other uh, eukaryotes that retract their flagella, these guys maintain their flagella the whole time, and in fact, they start growing new ones in mitosis, and it turns out because these are not membrane bound, they're in the cytoplasm, they actually get used as tracks to deliver uh, new membrane into the furrow. Um, and, and also they're used to generate forces and help orient, uh, for example, the daughter discs. There's a whole bunch of rearrangement of the flagella that happen. They get into position. And then these cells basically swim apart. And so we know from studies in, say, dictyostelium, if you knock out myosin, those cells can still divide by crawling apart. And so here, these aren't crawling apart. They're gonna, they're gonna swim apart. And I'll, and I'll show you a movie of this in a second. Uh, so then you generate this membrane tension by swimming, and then we know that actin and, and RAB11 are involved in some membrane remodeling for the final abscission step. Okay, so I'm gonna play this DIC movie just so you get an impression of how, what this looks like, and I also wanna make the point that this is incredibly fast. So at time zero, this cell will enter mitosis based on some flagella re rearrangement, and so at the top here, this is minutes, seconds, and around seven minutes, and you're gonna see that the furrow will form and this cell is just gonna rip itself in half. And I think you can see the flagella in here, they're, they're flexing, orienting things. Um, I wish we could put this through the cell profile, or the Allen Institute thing and see what's going on in there. But okay, so you saw the cell just ripped itself apart really quickly, uh, and I think that's pretty amazing. So as far as we know, this is the fastest dividing eukaryote. And um, okay, so we, we've, we've timed a whole bunch of cells and we see that the median time for mitosis is about six and a half minutes. That's not counting chromatin condensation because we can't see that and we didn't look at it. Uh, but the time in cytokinesis, once the furrow forms, it's only 49 seconds. So like I said, this is really, really fast. Um, and we think that the reason why these cells divide so quickly is that, remember, they have to take apart their ventral disc when they divide, 
And that means they have to let go of the host intestine. And so if they detach, they can get swept out. And so we think there's been all the selective pressure for them to be able to divide as quickly as possible and reattach. Okay, and, and one thing we wondered about, but we haven't, didn't really publish, uh, is that uh, where does the membrane come from to support this division? So in, in normal round cells, there's something like a 20% increase in surface area when you go from one big cell to two small cells. And we saw that if we treated cells with Feldon A, it would, it would inhibit uh, cytokinesis. And so I'm just showing you here, we get a bunch of cells that are never able to divide in the presence of Feldon A. But if we quantify furrow progression, what we see is that the furrow really regularly gets about halfway and then it gets stuck. And so this suggests that there is some kind of membrane reservoir available until you get to that point, right? Um, and so we think that this uh, membrane protrusion around the edge called the ventrolateral flange could actually be serving as a reservoir. Sort of the idea of like, you know, if you uh, have a, you know, you have big clothes and you eat a lot, then you have room to expand, right? So um, that's shown here. So, whoops. Okay, so actually when these cells enter mitosis, it turns out that this structure gets much larger. And then uh, you can see this a little bit further along, the, the new discs are forming on the top of the cell here. And then when it actually goes through cytokinesis, that furrow, do, that uh, membrane protrusion does get consumed, okay? Um, and so we uh, were interested in this structure, but really nobody had studied it because there wasn't any handle on it. And so the, really the only publication that you can find in the literature is, is this study here. So this guy, Stan Erlinson, was interested in the idea that the ventral disc was a suction cup and it made negative pressure. And so to test that, he microfabricated surfaces that have these little pegs. And the idea was that if Giardi really needed negative pressure, all the cells should only stick to the flat parts and not the little pegs. And so that was mostly true, but he saw that some cells did stick to the pegs. And when you zoom in on those cells, what you see is that that ventrolateral flange grows out and makes these kind of uh, adhesions, all right? And, and that's really as far as the studies ever went because uh, Stan passed away the year after that, and, um, and at the time there weren't any, any molecules identified that were working in the flange, and there weren't any genetic tools to, to manipulate the system. Okay, so, the, but the fact that, especially after Julie's talk, uh, you see that this really kind of resembles uh, lamellopodia, and so that sets up a context for us to think about this structure, right? Um, oh, actually, I'm jumping ahead of myself. So, I said all that stuff is not characterized, but, but actually our search for active mining proteins is what gave us a handle on this structure. And so I just want to uh, take you back and remind you that in cells, we control when and where filaments are formed, right? And so that's part of that whole RHGPA signaling and ARP23 and formin, right? So, the, so those proteins can stabilize these nucleation seeds. And once you have this nucleation seed, it's energetically favorable to actually make a filament. But I already told you that Giardia is missing ARP23 and formin. It's missing all the conserved actin mining proteins. But there's a really divergent uh, class of actin nucleators that only have one thing in common. They have these little WH2 domains. So here's an example of um, two WH2 domains from Spire. And they help stabilize this nucleation seed. Um, and, and one reason why we thought to look for these is that when you look at uh, where this binds, it turns out that this is a fairly well conserved part of uh, Giardia actin. So we uh, did some fibroblast searches and we found a whole bunch of proteins that have putative WH2 domains. But this one caught our attention because it had something called the Bro1 domain, which is known to be a regulator of the escort complex, but it's been shown at least for the mammalian protein Alex that it uh, binds F actin. So we thought, okay, that's interesting. Maybe you have an F actin binding domain and then it had three putative WH2 domains. So we tag this protein, and uh, if we pull it down, we can enrich for actin in, in pull downs. And when we localized it, it localized to this uh, ventrolateral flange. And so we thought, okay, that's cool. Now we have a handle on this structure, and we can try to understand what is it doing in the cell. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so uh, I already alluded to the fact that it looks a lot like lamellopodia. And, and the thing is, Jordan is missing all these uh, kind of proteins that are regulating actin dynamics, but it does, but Giardia does have a single row family GTPase that looks more like a rack homolog. It has a single PAC kinase, um, but everything else besides actin is, is missing. So we don't really understand how do you build the structure, how do you regulate its size, things like this. Um, but we can ask some questions like, is this uh, structure dynamic like lamellopodia? Does this protein, we're calling it flangin, does it contribute to ventrolateral flange formation? And do actin and rack have a role in, in its construction? Okay, so the first thing we did is just, we tagged this protein with imneon green, and if we do FRAP experiments, uh, you see that there's absolutely no turnover, it's completely stable. And so um, I'll remind you that in, in uh, lamellopodia, you get turnover of, of the actin components about every minute, 
Um, and since we see minimal uh, recovery, that suggests that there's actually a really stable structure being built here. Okay. Um, but that was an interphase. And so actually, if we look at mitotic cells, which I showed you, the flange gets bigger in those SEM images. Um, we see that it actually becomes dynamic here. And I'm going to just manually go through this movie. Um, whoops. That's not what I meant to do. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. So first of all, I want to point out, this is an interphase cell here. This is a mitotic cell here. And you can see the flange is already getting bigger uh, based on this protein. Uh, and also in the DIC, you can see it here. So as I go forward, when the cell enters uh, cytokinesis, I hope you can notice that now the, the flange is getting consumed. And the protein that was on the edge is now becoming cytoplasmic, especially compared to the control cell here. And if I go farther forward, okay, so now the cell is divided. All the protein cytoplasmic. And if you look here, there's, not a, there's no halo here, so there, there's no lamellopodia, there's no flange. Um, but as I go forward, you'll see the flange starts to regrow, and you'll see our protein comes back out to the surface. So the, so the protein is dynamic, but only during this part of the cell cycle. These are just uh, fixed images of what I already showed you, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just go ahead in the interest of time. Um, but the other thing that suggests that this is a reservoir of membrane is that we, we were trying to see, well, what part of the protein gets it recruited to the flange? And so we made this tetanusable con uh, construct where we just had the bro-domain, and that turns out to be sufficient to get the protein to the flange. And we're imaging this. What we saw is that uh, these cells had trouble retracting the flange, and I'll, pl I'll play the movie. And you'll see that, that there's some weird stuff happening that they can't pull in the, the the membrane intrusion, the cell gets stuck down, which indicates the uh, adhesive property. Um, so here, let me play this. You're going to see that the cell tries to swim away from the cover glass, and it's going to stick there. And you're even going to see the membrane is sort of ripping here as the cell's pulling off. You know, it's trying to swim away. So we think that suggests that it really is a membrane reservoir. <coughs> okay, what about actin? So um, we fix and stain actin. We have to use an antibody because, like I said, Floydin doesn't work. Um, and you can see there's some actin out at the edge here. Here's the flange protein. And you can see the actin actually protrudes a little bit further than the, the flange protein at, at the edge here. And, and it's hard, you know, there's a lot of, the, this, this is really, really thin structure compared to the thickness of the body of the cell. That's why it's kind of hard to see the filaments out there compared to how much signal comes from the body. But it's definitely there. And if we knock down actin, what you see is that, um, so I hope you can see this halo here around the cell. When we knock down actin, it can no longer deploy the flange, so it kind of collapses in on itself, or you have uh, where it just, it's just not being displayed. And then if we knock down the flange protein, similarly, we see that the flange isn't maintained properly. Okay? And so we can quantify that, and we see that um, both are significant. Uh, they're both important for building the structure. But the kind of the cool thing is, um, well, let me, let me say, one, one annoying thing is we knocked down these proteins, and then we, we knocked down the flange protein, and we did long-term movies, and we never saw any cytokinesis defect, which kind of upset us. We're like, well, if the flange is important, then what, why is that happening? But the thing is, we saw this. So if, you, so if you knock down the flange protein, so this is not scaled equally. We crank this up so you can see what protein remains. Um, the flange still gets bigger during, during mitosis, okay? And if you look at the edge here, so here's the control. You have, the, you have actin, you have the flange protein. Um, so here, the flange protein is only at the, near the body of the cell, but actin is still pushing out. So, so what we think is happening is that, and unfortunately, we don't have live uh, actin marker that we can see this happening with. But what we think is happening is that actin actually pushes the membrane out, and then the flange protein uh, sort of shores the structure up. And this is how we can make a stably sized uh, structure, because um, I think you saw from Julie's movies that regular lamellopodia are really dynamic, and you can't, it's hard for cells to just, they don't just make a structure and leave it. That, that won't happen because there's constant turnover. But here, you can have this other system to like shore up the, the membrane protrusions. Okay, so what about our road GTPase? Um, so I think it's hard to see, but if you squint, you can see there's a little bit of signal out at the edge here. Uh, but more telling, we can take the crib domain from Giardia's PAC kinase, and that's a CDC42 interaction binding domain. So it only binds GTP-loaded RAC. And when we look at that, we see that it is, in fact, enriched uh, around the flange. Um, and then uh, more telling, if you actually uh, knock down the, the, the road GTPase in Giardia, we see that the flange becomes serrated. And so clearly, the road GTPase signaling is still important for building the structure, even though we don't have all the other conserved actin binding proteins, okay? Um, and, and so this is a highly penetrant phenotype. So we're pretty confident about it. Okay, um, 
Now, going back to, well, is it actually adhesive? So we have a really simple assay uh, where you just, these cells will grow attached to the side of culture tubes. And so you can simply count how many cells are attached versus how many are floating around. And when we did that, we saw no difference between our control cells and we knocked down the flange protein. However, if you knock down RAC or actin, we, we do see differences, but there's also a bunch of morphological defects. And so we could be impacting the ventral disc. Um, so this is a little bit disappointing, but luckily, um, we have Nate Sadecki at South Lake Union, and so we contacted Nate about, oh, I'm jumping ahead of myself, sorry. So, uh, okay, the idea is that maybe, I hope you've appreciated the fact that Giardia is sort of a high performance machine, it divides really quickly, it lives in this really extreme environment, and when you look at the shape, it's, it looks like it's you know, um, optimized for like hydrodynamic uh, forces. Um, in fact, it looks a lot like this Ferrari that won a, a speed contest, right? So this would be like the flange, okay? <clears throat> So, uh, so we wanted, to, we wanted to challenge these cells because we, we, the, those attachment assays are, are not challenged. And remember, they still have the ventral disc. So, um, and, it, and it turns out there's another lab at, at UC Davis that works on Giardia. And if they knock down disc proteins and disrupt the ventral disc, the cells still attach. Um, and so they have to challenge them to see any, any defects. So we contacted Nate uh, Snedecki about um, some flow chamber experiments and his uh, grad student Nikita helped us do the experiments, and so I'm gonna play this movie, because it takes a while to get going. And what I want you to see is we, so we load the cells up in this flow chamber, and right now we're just like having a really gentle flow to push out the guys that never attached. Um, and these lines are the paths these cells are eventually gonna take once we crank up the speed. I also want you to notice that some of these cells, are ran they're randomly oriented, but once we start turning up the flow, they're all gonna orient against the flow. Um, and then, uh, and uh, you can't see back there probably, but we're at 20 seconds, so at, at 30 seconds, we're gonna ramp it up up the speed. At 35 seconds, it'll be at full speed and we'll start quantifying the, the movement and you'll see little purple circles show up. So there we go. So I hope you can appreciate that all of the knockdown cells are sliding. So these are kind of like wet suction cups, if you ever had those suction cups in your shower or something. Um, and the, the other cells, these control cells, a lot of them can resist the flow and they don't move. And so we quantified that. So here's a histogram of the velocities and here's a, a plot. And so we know that these are, uh, there's a significant difference in the speed. So that's great. So now we've established that, you know, a couple things for this structure. It's, it's important for, um, it's a membrane reservoir for division and it's also uh, important for attachment, right? And so it even makes sense, more sense that the flange gets bigger during mitosis because you're gonna take down the disc and so that extra surface space can help you attach more. Um, and, and then now where we're at is, um, so uh, entered a collaboration with Justin Coleman and, and, and a postdoc Kelly, and so we're trying to actually solve what is the organization of actin and, and the rest of the cytoskeleton in the flange, and so we're trying to do uh, electron tomography. And so um, it's still early days, but, but Kelly has figured out how to get the cells attached to these lacy carbon grids, and um, this is an early reconstruction. And actually, when you, she plays the movie, you can see some filaments, but in the projection, it, it's hard to see anything. Um, and so we're still working on getting fiduciary marks so these reconstructions are, are good. But the other thing that Kelly wants to do is to actually solve, you know, what is the structure of Giardia actin because it's the most divergent actin that is, is in any eukaryote. And then uh, what kind of feeds into this uh, story is that I have a grad student, Melissa Stilogos. She's pulled down actin binding proteins and found uh, a couple more proteins that go to the, to the flange. And also, uh, really intriguingly, she found uh, this protein that she's working on now that goes to the ventral disc. And the reason why we're so interested is that we had no idea that, and she's already verified this protein binds Giardia actin. So um, we think it's really intriguing that Giardia has a role in both mechanisms of, of attachment, right? So it have, has a role in maybe regulating the ventral disc. So, um, I don't have time to really get into it, but, but these two places where this protein localizes are thought to be gates in the disc that are regulating flows and, and attachment. So we're pretty excited about that. Okay, so then just to wrap it up, I showed you that um, flange and actin and rack are the, are the first proteins uh, identified that regulate the formation of the structure. Um, and, and it kind of parallels what goes on the lamellipodia, but, it, but I'm not saying this is, it's not a lamellipodia. Um, also, I, I told you that this structure appears to be uh, adhesive and also act as a membrane reservoir. And one thing my lab is starting to do is, is to actually look at these parasites in the animal model. And another, another thing that we've wondered is, is this structure also involved in pathogenesis? Uh, because you can imagine that this, this, this uh, okay, so Giardia secretes a lot of effector proteins that impact the host. And it would make a lot of sense to sort of 
secrete them into an airlock between the parasite and the host and not out the back of the cell into the rest of the chyme that's going through the intestine, right? It would be pretty wasteful. So um, we want to actually look at, we have luciferase expressing parasites, and so we want to look at what happens in an actual infection if we disrupt the flange. Okay, um, and almost all this work I talked to you about was uh, done by Bill Harden, who was a graduate student in the lab and has moved on, and then uh, Melissa found the actinomyotic proteins I was telling you about. So um, I already acknowledged my collaborators. So uh, with that, I'll take any questions. So again, if you could please raise your hands and a microphone will be passed to you to ask questions. Yeah, I know it's weird, so it's probably not what you're used to thinking about. So with your flangin protein, you showed it has um, both a, uh, an F-actin binding domain and these G-actin binding domains. So it seems like it's well positioned to be a nucleator. Um, were you able to directly test nucleating activity? No, so that's part of Kelly's project. So the idea of, of trying to purify, so we've had a lot of trouble purifying Giardia actin. Uh, in fact, that was originally Melissa's project and Justin Coleman was on our committee and he was like, well, maybe you guys need a real biochemist to do it. And so he, uh, so then, so Kelly uh, actually solved multiple um, crystal structures as a grad student and she spent a year trying to get this going and, and um, it looks like She's getting some protein now using, um, using this weed germ uh, like cell-free expression system, but which is gonna be really expensive. So we can't do the kind of conventional uh, biochemistry that we wanna do, but that, that's the goal eventually to get there and also to have a long-term collaboration with Justin's lab because once we have the ability to make filaments and get structures, we can purify these other proteins and see how do they impact the structure, right? So I think it's, that, that's, the, that's the dream, that's the vision. Is it possible that the changes that you see in the actin are to enable it to survive this very acidic environment? Do you know if the inside of the giardia is uh, is more acidic um, once it gets into the into the gut? That's a great question. So um, I think the pH of the of the intestine is maybe it's like six, right, when the stomach dumps things out, but then it goes up to around seven, um, and it turns out that 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 those changes in the, in the pH of the intestine are actually signals the parasites use to determine when they're gonna turn it back into cysts, which I didn't talk to you about. Um, we, we don't, so we definitely think there's some maybe weird things going on with the pH in the cell. Nobody's ever measured what the actual pH is. Uh, we, we, we're trying to do that now with some uh, fluorine uh, marker. Um, I also didn't mention these guys don't have lysosomes. You know, they don't, they're missing mitochondria. They don't have Golgi, they're really strange cells. Um, and so we've had a lot of trouble purifying different proteins uh, from them. And we don't know if it's because their intercellular environment is much different than conventional proteins. So, I mean, I, I think, that we think that that's probably what's going on. We don't, so YFP does not express well, and does not fluoresce in these cells, which is a sign that they could be acidic inside because YFP is sensitive to acidic pHs. Yeah, but that, that's, the only data, that's the only thing I know. Yeah. Um, great talk. I was just interested in uh, when you're talking about when they divide that they tear themselves apart because they still have the flagella moving. Um, do they move further in the intestine then, or do they? How do they reattach then? So, so they 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 quickly reattach and 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 actually so in a way our our knockdown experiments where there's not a flange and they, this parasite still attach is not surprising because we see when we film the cells and they divide they immediately reattach and they don't have a flange yet right like in that movie I showed yeah. you. So it wasn't that surprising. And the other thing I can tell you is that when we, when we um, culture these guys and we make transgenic cells and we select for them, you'll actually find little colonies in the tubes. So almost all the cells will die and you'll see like a little patch. And so they really do have this propensity to, to just reattach as close to where they were as they can. Okay, thank you. Hi, I was curious with the newer proteins that your graduate student found that's binding to actin, could you use a solvent exchange mass spec to try to figure out where the binding interactions are happening between those proteins? I, it, honestly, I haven't, I haven't thought of that. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't looked at that. And, and right now, all, all, we, all, we, all she really did is she cross-linked the cells. We have an antibody against actin. We pulled that down. We sent off for mass spec. And then, um, and then she tagged all those proteins, and then she's done reciprocal pull-downs. Uh, 
on a few of them, and, and the one that goes to the disk is one of the ones she's really interested in because uh, nobody knew that Acton might have a role in, in the disk. And then we think it's important because it makes the study of Acton even more important in Giardia if it's important for both mechanisms of, of, of attachment, right? Um, but, but, but I don't, th there's lots of stuff we can eventually do. I mean, really, if, if, if we ever get the Crow em working, we could, we could actually determine all the interaction interfaces, right? Um, but it's just a matter of having protein. So, so Justin assures me, once we have protein, like the structure is simple. It's, it's just getting the protein that's the challenge. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move on to our next speaker. Thank you so much, Alex.